about um, six months in, we were on the road. We were in Hawassi, Georgia. We got home late that evening, about midnight. Went straight to the emergency room. The doctor came in and uh, she said, Mr. and Mrs. Yuri, I'm so sorry, but your baby's heart has stopped beating. And And all I can say was, why God? But I didn't just say it, I screamed it. Why God? And then that moment of, what did I do? Do I deserve this? Have I done something wrong? Was it that mistake I made? Was it because I got a divorce? Was it because I... Coming up in two minutes is episode number 13 of the Good Grief, Good God Show, hosted by Grammy nominee and Emmy award-winning hit songwriter of 15 top 10 songs, including nine number ones, Brad Warren of the Warren Brothers. I'm producer Matt Pivato. Join Brad on your favorite audio platform or video on YouTube for raw, honest conversation about surviving things that suck. For today's episode, Brad welcomes singer-songwriter and mandolin player and vocalist of the Isaacs, Sonia Isaacs. The Isaacs are made up of Lily and her three children, Ben, Sonia and Becky. The Isaacs have won 19 Dove Awards and have received three Grammy nominations. They've recently celebrated their 50th anniversary and were inducted into the Grand Ole Opry and Gospel Music Hall of Fame. As a songwriter, Sonia has had songs recorded by the likes of Trisha Yearwood, Martina McBride, to Vince Gill and Sarah Evans, along with dozens of bluegrass and gospel artists. Sonia is also a frequent contributor to singing background vocals for artists including Reba, Brad Paisley, Dirks Bentley, and Carly Pierce. Personally, Sonia's soul is even more beautiful than her music. Her upbringing, including her story of loss, resonated deeply with Brad, especially the heartbreak of losing a child. Over the next hour, Sonia will share how her faith and relationship with God has pulled her through her darkest days. To learn more about today's guest, Brad, and the show, check the description where you will also find a clickable link to visit goodgriefgoodgodshow.com. On the behalf of Brad's wife, Michelle, and segment producer and guest booker, Lisa Bolt, thank you for tuning in. And we hope you too will find the good in grief. The Good Grief, Good God Show is brought to you in loving memory of Sage Michael Warren. He actually comes from Houston every month, maybe twice, and shoots a couple podcasts. He lives in Houston, and he sets us up in here, and then we we take it down, and he puts it all in the garage. He chased me down when we were talking about doing this, and and uh, it was his idea. He. He he produces Pat, Jack Ingram's podcast, and um, and so we were we just ran into each other at a catering at this that Mac Jack and McConaughey event last year, and he's like, "Heaven wanted to meet you. I want you to I want to talk about it, doing a podcast on grief." And I'm like, "Oh no, that's that's a nice idea. That sounds good. People do need to talk about it, but not not me." <laughs> not. And then I kept, we had a couple, couple of phone conversations and one morning my wife was, I was like, yeah, I don't really know. She goes, you're doing this. You know, you're, you know you're doing this. And it's been great. I'm sure every young podcaster wants to be Joe Rogan. Instead, I decided to do something on grief. <laughs> you know? I think it's brilliant. And I love the title. It's, it's clever and it's, it draws you in. Um, my friend Lance Miller yesterday, he was singing your praises. Yeah. Aww. Well, I, I always have a quote for my guest. And so the quote I had was from Oscar Wilde. And his quote was, the only people I would quit care to be with now are artists and people who have suffered. Those who know what beauty is and those who know what sorrow is. Nobody else interests me. I love that. You know, the, the more you live and the deeper you get into life, the more, like he said, superficial people just kind of take you off and you don't really... You can't find anything in common with that anymore. It's amazing after, uh, once our son died, it's hard for me to have a small talk conversation. Just like, do we have any, are we talking about something? So I, I kind of dive deep and some people are like, they'll dive in there with you. Like my Lance Miller, I was just talking about, man, he'll go right down the hole with me. And then other people are like, Oh my God, this guy wants to talk about death at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it's a little, it's, I think it's a little much for people, but I'm kind of where he is. It's like, I just, um, you have a, uh, you can see into someone's soul when they have had loss and a chemistry with the, with those kind of people. And my wife and I, when we run into a couple, it's, it's had the same thing. I mean, we're just immediately connected to them. First of all, I want to know a little bit about you because we, my family, we all sang and we did little things at other churches. But we didn't, 
it wasn't a thing. So I wanted to know a little bit about that before we delve into the whole. Yeah. Okay. So uh, probably I, my family isn't as well known to the people that know your music um, because we grew up in, in the gospel scene and more. Nobody on, knows our music, so you're bluegrass. fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the bluegrass world, um, our dad was hardcore bluegrass. The baby child of 17 children from the hills of eastern Kentucky. They didn't have a TV. They didn't have running water. That's how my dad grew up. But he loved music, and he loved bluegrass music. In fact, he was raised against music at all. They were Church of Christ, and he wasn't even allowed to play music. And then when he um, left home, and he was very talented, he just started playing music and following that dream. Played with guys like the Stanley Brothers, and when Carter died, he filled in for him. So he had a very um, strong bluegrass background. Our mom, my mom is the baby, uh, she's, the, she's the oldest of two. Her parents are Polish Jewish Holocaust survivors. My grandparents are Holocaust survivors on my mom's side. Oh, wow. So they survived the nightmare of the Holocaust and were taken to a French army relief camp in Germany. And that's where my grandparents were married. And my mom was born there. And they moved to America when she was two years old and she grew up in the Bronx. She was a hippie. How in the hell did your parents meet each other? It was music. It was music. It was the opposites attract. And this is the perfect example of it. Um, My mom was musical. She was an off-Broadway. She grew up in the Bronx. um, And she got a record deal on Columbia Records in the 60s with her friend Maria, Lily and Maria, a little duet. And... um, and so they were playing in a club and called Gertie's Folk City in Greenwich Village, New York in the late 60s. And my dad's bluegrass band was from Kentucky. They traveled up to New York and they were playing the same gig for like six weeks. And um, they fell in love. His name's Isaac, Joe Isaac. So my mom thought he was Jewish. So he <laughs> <laughs> could have been further. From, <laughs> but I may be down in the bloodline. But, but they fell in love and got married. And then there was a tragedy and my dad's brother got killed in a car accident around Christmas time. And um, they, so they found themselves going to church and my mom was raised in a Jewish home, but not very, not very um, strict Jewish, just Mm -hmm. really to more honor. Jewish. Jewish. Yes, exactly. And even though my dad grew up in a Pentecostal home, he, he kind of ran from all that. Mm -hmm. And um, so when they went to my uncle Delmer's funeral, they both accepted Christ and began that journey together and they started singing together. So that, that's where the music you know, came into play. And then, and so for years before we were born, they started singing. And then as my brother and sister and I were born, we just kind of joined in the family grew, band. Yeah. They said, if we couldn't sing, they threw us back. So how many kids are there? in your, There are three of us. Um, and you, okay. So you're all, I have some half older this. siblings, but, um, Ben is the oldest. He's the bass player and singer and Becky plays guitar and sings. She's the baby and I'm in the middle. So. You're the middle child. Yeah. The middle child. That's, uh, I saw, thought of that church of Christ where, where even bluegrass is a rebellion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm gonna yeah, rebel against this rebel. church. I'm gonna play bluegrass, you know, because <laughs> we were we were Pentecostal, like like really? uh, we called it Bapticostal. Yeah, we were yeah. um like like a an inch and a half short of snake handling, but very right. very Holiness. lots of lots of slain in the spirit. Yeah, lots of speaking in tongues, lots of uh, flailing about, and yeah. uh, our pastor. You grew up that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, wow. um, we did. Too. Our pastor would jump out of the baptismal. We we learned to play instruments in church. My dad. I mean, I started playing guitar when I was 11. So my dad showed me, a few, or my mom showed me a few chords, and I was better than her by a week. And then my dad kind of showed me a little bit. We just started playing. We played everything. So Brett and I both played drums and bass and whatever in church, and, and our, uh, our pastor would be in the baptismal, and he would baptize somebody, and he would say, kick it off, and they would kick <laughs> the band off, and he would jump out of the water and run across the back of the choir pews, soaking wet. And then run up and jump on top of the, the uh, pulpit and be shaking it. I have no idea how he didn't crash. And then he would, and if the band would start playing and we'd be rocking, you know, whatever that meant. And uh, he would take off running down one aisle. And there was an elder at the back, you know, and he would just open that door. And he would <laughs> fly out that door. And then the other aisle, there was another elder and he would open the other one. And he would fly back through that next one and go back in. And, uh, and now that pastor's granddaughter is married to my nephew and, and it's like our families are still that very awesome. you know it's close and he's he's passed away but it's it was really interesting so we yeah, kind of that a lot we we just just rock music in general was a rebellion it's cool to have grown up in that in that kind of environment though because you're not afraid of anything when you go to church like nothing scares you anymore so you're pretty cool you know you're pretty- my wife is catholic we are all catholic now basically <laughs> and um and she can't She's scared at our church, so we don't go. I go to my <laughs> old church, but she doesn't know she's scared. So it's now like, you're a Catholic hostel. I I'm a it. cool Catholic hostel. I've got all the baggage for everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I think that's, um, you know, it's, I love how just our growing up like that, just 
it creates who we are. And, and I, I think it makes us well-rounded when we have those kind of experiences too. Cause you, and then, you know, the thing about growing up in that kind of church for me was, was everybody took, you know, everybody else's word for it. And you didn't really, they didn't encourage you to really study for yourself. And so when I got old enough to really look into the scriptures and, and figure out and understand, you know, salvation for myself and what, what do these rules mean? And why do we live this way? And why, why am I not allowed to wear pants and makeup and like all the things. And when you start studying it for yourself and you realize that a lot of that's just traditions and, you know, and, and some, sometimes they mean well, they just, they just don't really, you know, so I was very glad and moving to Nashville was a big step for me. And that just opened in my eyes to like, a, and I was already 22 when I moved here. So you know, I was I was grateful to see a different perspective on Christianity than what mm-hmm. I'd grown up in. When we need God for ourselves, not our parents' version or whatever, and we find um, it's awesome, regardless of how it is that we get there. And so, um, I I was grateful for the upbringing because honestly, I had great parents and a great childhood, but it just didn't it did, something didn't click for me at the time, and I had to take the long way around it. But it's we're you know we're in, we we love the same God now. Right. And I think the thing that's missing in what we grew up in is the grace factor, you know, which is the the biggest component of, of God. You know, it's the grace and the love. And that was touched on, but it was more about your deeds and how, you know, what you did and what you did out of church and in church. And, and I, you know, and I, I know a lot of people that run from God that grew up and Jimmy, my husband, Jimmy Erie. He grew up in a very amazing strict... singer songwriter. We'll talk about your kids later. They <laughs> must be incredibly talented. Yeah. Well, Jimmy grew up um, in a very strict Baptist church, but it was all hellfire and brimstone. There was no grace, and and he found himself running from God because I'm like he's like I can't live it. Why you know why try why try if I can't live up to those expectations? I'm human, and um, you know he he went wayward and just you know lived a wild life and. And, you know, built a lot of regret along the way. But then it was um, one day in his, in the deepest, darkest place of his life that he finally knelt down. He's like, you got to help me, God. You know, I believe in you. You got to help me. And then he started AA and that changed his life. That's awesome. So I love that. That's God. awesome. Yeah, it's funny because my mother is, who, when I was at the bottom of whatever, my mother was who I called. Mm. Was, I've been almost 18 years now. But I, and I'm like, okay, I'm trying to quit drinking. I know my life's going south. My lovely wife who's still here by the grace of God was leaving, you know, and she should have been, it was just a mess. And I'm like, I'm going to call my mom and ask her to pray with me. And that's like the strangest reaction because I, at that moment, you know, I was very far from, from any of that. Well, I want to get into this. I just, something that I wrote down that I wanted to bring up uh, for you um, because when I read your story and about your, your baby and what, I think in church, and I don't know exactly where you, because it sounds like you grew up in a less charismatic thing. We were Pentecostal holiness. Right. Like we think we earned whatever happens. If, if something good happens, then we earned it. And if something bad happens, we caused it. And um, that's what I learned at church. <clears throat> a lot of hellfire and brimstone and a lot of if there's, if you're having problems, there's sin in your life. And if there's sin in your life, it's your own fault. And the works was the reason that it happened. <clears throat> and I kind of felt that in your story a little bit where you thought, that, you know, because of the, what would seem to me to be the minutest of things would cause God to say, no, I'm not going to give you what you want. And that, I think now on the other side of that, you probably feel like that's crazy because I do feel like that's crazy. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think when you go through grief, you, um, you got to look at everything and on all the reasons why this happened. And, you know, and I, it's a human nature to question and go like, all right, did I deserve this? Could I have avoided this? Could I have prevented this? And, you know, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. I mean, you can't put it any more simpler than that, is that the good and the bad people are going to go through it. So it's how you go through it and who goes through it with you that matters and that changes the outcome. So, um, yeah, I did, you know, I, I, I you know, I've, I've been through, I've been very guarded in my life. Like I grew up in an ideal home with a family that, you know, we traveled together. We started, mom and dad started singing when we were just little bitty kids. And then we started kind of taking our place in the band and the group when we learned we could sing harmony at five, six, seven years old and started playing instruments. And, you know, by the time I was in high school, uh, my siblings and I and my parents were the group and there was nobody else playing instruments that we were it. And so it was a very guarded, protected life. We were on the road all the time. I can't tell you how many dances and proms and, 
you know, football games that we missed because we were already out there, you know, singing and, and, and we were, I mean, it was a grueling, you know, we were gone. If there's probably 200 days a year, we were gone. And was it wasn't, was it buses or was it Back vans? then it was, we started out in vans yeah, and then I we mean, graduated to a van and a trailer and then we went yeah, to an old yeah. 04 bus and then we got a little bit better bus with a trailer and then we got a newer and That's you know, not just, easy. we just listened just, the, just in 2020 is the first time we ever got a brand new bus. Really? Yeah. Wow. And that, that was bad timing. 2020 was not a good year. Yeah, yeah, they, oh, wow. That's a terrible time to get a friend. You can sit it in the yard and just go <laughs> sleep in it. Awesome. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I grew up guarded and, you know, but I, I found my way through my share of mistakes in life and, you know, making bad decisions and, and, you know, you can't help, but just go, God, you know, maybe I did this to myself and I had those feelings. We all do. I mean, it, interestingly, the better that you've been, it's maybe the, the harder you are on your, those, those mistakes because there are a few, I had so many mistakes. I was kind of like, Hey God, you can either take care of this or you can't. It's kind of like, can you, can you take care of this tab? It was so big. I knew I couldn't pay it. I think it's a little easier for me. And I, I, when I'm mine and Brett's sisters are, um, they're not perfect, but they're way closer than we ever have. <laughs> they're just, they're amazing. They just have never gone off the beam. And they're they're wow. wonderful Christian women with different strengths, but both of them, like if I need something, I mean, they're, they're go-to. And, uh, you know, they'll feel guilt about the strangest thing. Like, oh my God, you should see our resume. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, same house, by the way, and that's, a, that's another one that gives me, um, I get grace and I, I'm okay, get, feel okay with grace uh, that I'm getting when I think about what kind of parent were you that you lost the child? Well, first of all, my son died with a fentanyl and he was using drugs and he had struggled. And, and you can, it's very easy to find guilt in that. <clears throat> very, very easy to find. And then the truth is that my parents were the strict raising. We didn't have television. We had no television ever. <clears throat> no, you know, there was no, never a beer in our refrigerator. There was no cussing, no nothing. And I did what my son did the night he died a hundred times. Um, so it wasn't the, the raising that made it happen. Right. And also understanding that I grew up in the same house with my sisters who, if their sins could probably be on two hands and ours would need a legion of hands. And, um, we, we make our own paths and, and God's grace is there for all of us, the children, the parents, the grandparents, and however we go along. And me realizing I had less control than I, than I maybe thought I had. Cause I always said, my, my kid's not dying of this. He's not dying of this. I, I struggle with this and we're going to, and we addressed it and he was sober for like a year, but it was, um, I had to go, I don't have as much control. God knows what he's doing and I have to trust. And I've learned to trust in the last three years in a way that I wasn't capable of before. You know, God always, he, he gets so much glory out of the ones that have gone the farthest off the path. You know, you look at the Bible, it's full of people that, that were the worst of the worst. But yet they're the ones you know the most, you yeah. know, and they're the ones yeah. that God uses the most. And, and it's not about our ability. It's about our availability. I was raised <laughs> around well-meaning people, super sweet, well-meaning people. <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't make it wrong. It just, it just, none of us are right. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what's not going to happen for me. I'm not going to be surprised in heaven. I'm not going to be like, oh, you're kidding. You know, I mean, I, I'm going to be surprised either way, but there's nothing that's going to shock me. I realize that I need the grace. I need it so much. It's easy for me to surrender. So <clears throat> whatever the whatever the thing is that when we get there, and, and if, if everyone's there, I'm going to be cool with it. You know, yeah. in fact, I'd be cooler with it than I would be if, with the fire and brimstone. I mean, we're in there, and and um, you know, they're telling you who is and isn't going to heaven, and I'm like, oh no, don't don't just just be. How about start with like being kind? Right. Like, why don't we give each That's other right. grace? Why don't we give each other a little grace? And then, uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm growing into that still at 54. And we always will, you know, I think the way we grew up was a safe way, you know, and I think they intended well for us to don't mess with that. You know, let's label it a sin. So you don't have to go through life with the, you know, the issues that come from dabbling in that or getting soaked in it. And, and I understand that part of it, but at the same time, as I, you know, I was, trying to say is, is that the grace factor was missing in my upbringing. Like, and I love the Pentecostal church. I love the gifts of the spirit. I love, 
you know, I'm still very drawn to that and attached to that. And, but at the same time, my mind has expanded and my spiritual life has expanded to this is the way you teach me because this is the way you were taught. And, but this is the way I feel about it. It's not just this, it's all this. And I'm so thankful for grace and God's love and what that, the way that I know God right now. You know, mm-hmm. He's my dad. Yeah. He's my dad. Yeah. And he loves me more than he wants to harm me. He wants, he wants the good for me and he, and he doesn't just want to punish me. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I, the, the best way I look at, at my heavenly father is that is comparing myself to being to my father and how I raise my children. And, you know, it, and I, I, the best way for me to understand my feelings towards God and how he looks at me is to compare myself to, to a father or a child. And, and I think all the time, what would God think? And I think, well, what would I think about my son doing that or my daughter doing that? And that's kind of how I gauge my responses and my reactions and how I live and how I treat people. Disappointed. Yes. Yeah. Surely we disappointed, but like, does he stop loving? Oh, no. No, no you can't. I couldn't possibly stop loving my children. No matter Regardless. what they said to me, no matter what they did, no matter how they disobeyed me. No matter what they did to each other. And and I, I assume that you're okay with talking about your yeah. your baby because we're here. But I didn't realize until I was in this boat how similar it is. A stillborn baby, a 40-year-old, any parent that loses a child, there's a very similar reaction. A very, I, I relate to everyone who's lost a child. And I used to think it was, first of all, I didn't think about it very much. And second of all, I just thought, well, if you lose a baby, you didn't know. That's probably not that. Now, if you're old and they're old, it shouldn't. I mean, right. none of that is true. It's all life-changing. So. so I think, you know, when you lose a baby, you grieve the loss, but you grieve the life that you'll never know. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you grieve a son that you had a chance to know, you grieve what you knew. You grieve the future, but you also, but you've gotten to enjoy that person. And so for me, it was a a grief of, I'll never get to know what it's like to have a daughter to, you know, what would she have looked like? What would she have done? Would she have been musical? Was she, I mean, all the things that I'll never know. So it is, it's very much the same kind of grief, but you grieve different things too. I always wanted children. I was married when I was 20 years old. To a, a great guy, but we were very, very different. I ended up going through a divorce when I was 27. And I spent seven years, I think, single before I met my husband. And um, But even back when I was married the first time, my, I wanted children. I, I, okay, this, I love this story because it explains beautifully what my, where my heart was all along. We sang at Dollywood a lot, and they had this little... It was called Little Dolly Dress Shop, and you've probably seen it if you've been at Dollywood. Now it's just somewhere in Gatlinburg, but they had this little bitty, like, antique looking ruffly baby dress with a little matching bonnet. It was, like, a plaid with strawberries all over it. it had the little bloomers with the ruffles. You know what I'm talking about. You're watching yeah. this one. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I, I saw it, and I was married, and... And I thought, I'm going to buy this because I'm going to have a daughter and I'm going to put this on my daughter and, you know, <laughs> she will wear this and I will take pictures. And so I bought it and um, never had children in my first marriage and went through a divorce. I kept the dress. I don't know why. I, I kept the dress and like shoved it back in the back of the closet. And I was like, someday I, I hope I find somebody else and, and I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle. I'm not, you know, I'm going to find the right one if I am lucky enough. And, you know, so I was 30. I was 34 when I met Jimmy. I kept the dress, okay? And um, and so Jimmy and I, right, okay, so I met Jimmy, which is so cool, our story. It's, we were, when we were kids, his family sang together, and my family was singing, at this little TV station in Beattyville, Kentucky, a little cable TV station. Oh and um, he was 14, I was 10, and so he remembers me. I don't remember him, but I remember the place, I remember... There were children there and like just basic things about being there. And and then the cameraman's or the host ran away with the cameraman's wife or something like that. So they the show ended. I never saw him for 20 years, 25 years. And uh his we were both writing for I was writing for Disney, he was for Sony. 
And our publishers said, we think you guys write great together and we'd like to book you to write together. And I was like, okay, who's Jimmy Erie? So I'm looking him up on MySpace, remember MySpace? And uh, so he's like, so he tells his publisher, sure, I'd love to write with Sonia as, as long as it's okay that I'm in love with her. And I'm like, this I find out later, right? So we get in the room together and I mean, instantly we hit it off and we're completely attracted to each other. And I just gone through a breakup and he was, you know, kind of on the outs of a relationship. And so we, I mean, instantly fell in love and we started talking about when we were kids and he's reminding me, I remember Babyville, that was me. I was the kid you were there. And I'm like, no way. And, you know, and so. At, you, you acted know, like you remembered him at first. Didn't you? <laughs> well, I didn't want to hurt his feelings, yeah. but, <laughs> but I was 10. So I had a lot right, of grace yeah. for that. But, um, and so we just hit it off and, you know, a week later we were inseparable. It's awesome. And um, we got married six months later, engaged three months later, married six months later. And I was, um, you know, I was 35 or 34, 35. And my clock was ticking really loudly, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Jimmy had been divorced and had a daughter that was young at the time. And and so um, so we immediately started talking about kids. And I was like, I really so want you creeped him out and showed him the dress. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I did tell him about the dress, but it was so crazy. You know, but listen, listen to this. So we had started dating in um, June of 2009. His birthday was June the 8th. So we just passed his birthday. So I, I went and got him some gifts. And my birthday was in July. Guess what he got me for my birthday? More baby clothes. Oh, wow. All right. So we already had, like, we had That's gone awesome. beyond the point of return. We already knew we were going to, we weren't engaged yet, but he bought me these two cute little outfits. And he's like, oh, just in case. So that's awesome. Yeah. It's the Dolly thing is by. awesome because uh, my cousin Joel, he plays guitar for Cole Swindell and he and his wife, Lacey, have a daughter named Dolly that's a year old. And my wife is like, we buy so much Dolly stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she's super spoiled. Great. Um, yeah. So we have a whole and anything Dolly is like, she's, she's going to be going shopping. Down at that, Aww. Uh, that. I'll have to show you the dress. <clears throat> we, we knew instantly that we were going to get married and we wanted children and, you know, and so we did get married pretty quick. Um, we got pregnant about six months in and had our firstborn in um, 2011, Aiden, our little boy. Little boy right? We actually always loved the name Ava, and Ava means little bird. Didn't know that at the time, but I just love that name. And so we picked Aiden's name because we said, well, we'll have a girl next. We'll have a girl, you know, and so Aiden we'll name well, Aiden and Ava. So that was it. And so... Uh, when we didn't, Aiden didn't sleep well at all. So we waited about three years before we tried again and got <laughs> some sleep. And, um, and then I got pregnant I found out I was having a girl and, um, I was beyond excited. And I just, I got the little dress out of the back of the closet and I got on camera and our big gender announcement was we're having a girl. And I told everybody about the stress and here's the dress and I'm finally going to get to put this on a baby. And, you know, it was just like the greatest moment of all time. And, um, and so about, um, six months in, we were on the road, we were in Hawassi, Georgia, Georgia mountain fair. And I woke up that morning and I was hemorrhaging and, uh, we got home late that evening about midnight. I, I called my doctor and he said, well, just take it easy. And we were, we're going straight home after we sent, it was like an afternoon thing. So I went straight to the emergency room and I got there and um, it was about midnight and Jimmy met me there and my mom was with me. And, and so uh, my doctor was not there. It was late and he was out of town. And so they did an ultrasound and the whole time the girl was doing the whole sonogram, she would just, she was just very stern and I was just not getting any comfort at all from this. And, and, um, so, you know, I had to wait two hours for the doctor to come in to read the results because it was in the middle of the night. And I was like two weeks. It was so long. And just praying and just, you know, I, I was watching TV. I don't know if you've heard of the Gaithers, <laughs> the oh, Bill God, Gaither yes. and the Are Gaither music. Me? Okay. <clears throat> Gordon Boat. Yeah. I know he's not one oh of the Gaithers, God. but that's my no, buddy. No, yeah. I love Gordon. Yeah. And, um, and so Gordon. World's best piano player. Absolutely. And singer. He's amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been on the Gaither videos for years. And in that moment, I'm turning on the TV, trying to find something to pass the time before the doctor comes in with these results of what's going on with my baby. And, and the Gaither show comes on and like, and it hits me that these songs that I have sang my whole life and these videos that I've invested my life in being a part of, why they're so impactful to people because there was so much peace coming from that TV. Mm. Those songs that were about peace and hope. And I mean, it, it came alive to me just 
the reason why I do what I do and the power of songs and the power of the message of hopeful songs and God and the gospel. And um, soon the doctor came in um, and uh, she said, Mr. and Mrs. Yuri, I'm so sorry, but your baby's heart has stopped beating. And, and all I can say was, why God? But I didn't just say it, I screamed it. Why God? And then that moment of, what did I do? Do I deserve this? Have I done something wrong? Was it that mistake I made? Was it because I got a divorce? Was it because I, well, I did this or that? And, and I just, you know, Jimmy and I held each other and we cried. And, and I began the process of induced labor. And, but you know, it was, uh, looking back, It gave, you know, there's so much, so the songs that came from the, from the sorrows and the platform that we're in and the, the, the audience that we have. You can't relate to somebody that's lost a child unless you've lost one yourself. And I'm so grateful that God has given me songs through that. And, and I never, and I would get on stage and I would share my story with the audience and sing a song or two that came out of it. And. Every night I would have just tons of people come up and say, we lost a child, we lost a child. Thank you for sharing that or singing that. And, you know, and some people would say, we lost one, but we never talk about it. We mm -hmm. never talked about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, just it's okay to talk about it. And well, It's healing. It's the only healing. It really is. And that's the way I felt about sharing my story. It was like it was healing in the songs. And so, you know, God has a plan and he uses things. And I, I would never say that God you know, took my baby or whatever. But he promised to use things that, that are intended for evil for good. And I think if we let him, and no matter what the situation, that's what he does. Yeah, I've come to the realization, I, I feel like at least, that it doesn't have to be God's will to be part of his plan. That's great. And, and, I love that. And that goes for mistakes and then non-mistakes. Like, there's, you know, I'm, that is so hellfire and brimstone-y to be like, I lost a child, what did I do to... I just, I, and, and um, Ashley Cleveland has a great line that she, she says after she had her baby and she just didn't know if anything was going to be wrong with it. And she said, God said to her, I'm not who you think I am. And I think we kind of had the, I've always was raised with this. Well, you do bad, you're getting bad. You do good, you're getting good. And and we, the surrender and, and that I, I hate this being the case, but God has used the loss of my son, the ripple effect. There, there are you know, there will be 15 guys in this room tonight talking about losing their son, uh, their their sons or daughters or whatever they have that wouldn't exist if, if I didn't have to go through what I've had to, you know, what I've had to go through. My wife and I, that's, it's funny because my grief hasn't made it to the songs so much, a little bit. There will be a little bit of something in the songs. It certainly hasn't made it to the, we do, you know, songwriter events and it just hasn't, hasn't made it to, as part of the, the thing that I do yet, but I'm, we're obviously dealing with it because I'm doing this and we have, but we have these, you know, the groups that we're doing, but in, in our own lane, like God uses that thing. That's the worst <clears throat> to come with the best. And, um, you know, the, uh, in the Beatitudes, blessed are they that mourn for they will be comforted. My, my friend, Al Andrews always says, implying that if you don't mourn, you're not going to be comforted, <clears throat> you know? So that's like a requirement. And um, yeah, it's the people that we've been able to meet. I just, I'll say this. There's a there's an unbelievable freedom in not being afraid to die. I was always afraid of everything. And we laugh now about how we were scared that we hated flying. And now I'm like, I'm about ready to be one of those hurricane pilots and, you know, drive through the, it's amazing. To, Easy now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get a little crazy. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the truth is, I think it makes us live. We For the yeah. first time, you know, ever, we... And hearing that, and it's just, I hear it a different way than my wife said this morning. She was just, she said, I just grieved the things that didn't happen. But I did get 21 years, and you didn't get, before I would have thought, well, you didn't know that, baby. It can't be that hard on you. And the truth is, now I'm in this place, and I'm like, I, I can't expect people to have, I have to have grace for the people that don't understand this, that I have to deal with, because it doesn't go away. Some people are like, oh, you're going to do that forever? Yes. Yes, it will forever be 
there will forever be a hole in my heart. There will forever be a hole in your heart. They're different shaped, different sizes. And the, my grandmother um, lost both of her sons, my dad and her other son died when he was 12. And she was 80 and I was a drunk, drug using musician that just didn't notice it at the time. I didn't even think about it. This woman lost, and I, she's the second person I'm gonna look up in heaven. It's like, mm. you know, it's uh, the idea that, I, that you, you don't know anything. You don't know what you know until you know it. And now I can do what I can do and, and have grace for people that don't understand it. But I love you being willing to come and say it because the truth is everyone out there that's lost a child, you comfort them with this and I comfort them with mine and, and they comfort me with theirs. And I don't, I don't know why it's the craziest thing. I'm I, you know, I feel like mother Teresa sometimes she's like, I, I have, you know, so much faith, but God's got some explaining to do about a few things, you know, when I get there. And I think this is one of those things. It's like, man, there's beauty in this and there's healing in it, but it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I often think about people that lost children later in life and, you know, older children and, you know, when I'm thinking about my story and, um, you know, I, I can't say that I would, I would choose to have, to lose one that was, you know, I think that it would be harder to lose one that you'd already grown attached to. But for me, I was attached to her, the dream of her. And, and I was already 40 years old when she passed and I just, I didn't know if I could have any more children. I didn't know why she died. I didn't know. I never knew. I just knew that I didn't know if I could carry a healthy baby. And so going through that time before we got pregnant again and the fear that of what if this happens again and, mm -hmm. you know, um, am I too old? Am, am I too high risk to have a healthy baby and wanting desperately to have a daughter? And, you know, and so Jimmy and I, we, you know, we healed and, and there was so much support and love from the community and from everybody and people that have lost children and, it was like, oh my gosh, I know I can get through this because I'm seeing how where you are today, and um, and so we tried again, and six months later I got pregnant again, and I was I just knew I was going to get a girl, I just knew it, I knew God was going to reward me for being faithful and and <laughs> and praising Him through the pain, and once again you're going to be responsible for the outcome. Yes, yeah, and yeah. so uh, so uh, we had the <laughs> I don't think I should ever tell him this, but we had a. Um, you know, the gender reveal party at my mom's and it was a cake and I we cut into the cake and it was blue. And I was like. Well, you just told him, so he's going to know now. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll yeah. understand. He that. won't be watching this. <laughs> he yeah. won't be mad yeah. for long because it, it was blue. And um, I tried to put on a smile because, I, you know, and it wasn't that I didn't want another son. I love my son. But I just, I just thought at this age, with the risks and with our lifestyle being so busy, there's no way I can do this again. I'll never have a daughter. I'll never have a daughter. No girl will ever wear that dress in that closet. So for me, it was just a reality of, okay, I have to come to terms with, I'll never have a daughter again. That's it. And so, um, so everybody went outside after we cut the cake, and I went in the bedroom and cried my eyes out, and... Uh, <laughs> and I, I just had that come to Jesus moment, you know, and, and uh, I was like, all right, God, if you want me to have a boy, then there must be a good reason for it. And he's going to be a darn special kid. And so I got happy about it. And um, thank God he was healthy. And, you know, I did I I did have, um, golly, at four months into my pregnancy, um, I started hemorrhaging again. And uh, that was a scary time because I, again, we were on the road and I thought, Lord, I'm going to. I'm going through this again. I don't understand. You know, I was scared to death and went to the ho hospital and, and uh, it was just a tear in my uterus and he was fine. And uh, thank God I, I wrote, I wrote another song pe called Peace and Trusting on that morning when I was going to the hospital. And so God uses these sorrows to give us songs. And for me, at least he has. So, um, so when Gatlin was born, he was three weeks early and he was it's still eight pounds. It was huge. And <laughs> um, Gatlin, I love it. Yeah. And actually, let me tell you a funny story. We, I was eight months pregnant, and Jimmy and I could not decide on a name for him. Like, we had no boy names that we liked, that we loved. And so we're at the Opry, and Larry Gatlin walks up to me. And, you know, Larry, he's, he's such a cut up. And he goes, you going to name that baby after me? And I said, Larry Yuri. No, probably not. And I said, Gatlin. Ooh, I like Gatlin. And I texted Jimmy. I was like, hey, what do you think about Gatlin? He's like, that's it. I love it. So, so Gatlin easy. came from Gatlin. 
And if it makes you feel any better, my wife cried all three times that she found out she was having boys. And the truth is, down the road, she was made to be the mother of boys. Uh, But she, yeah, every time, she cried every time. Yeah, it's just, yeah, that's one of those things that God definitely has control of. It's like the weather, you know, I mean, there's there's only so much we can do about. But you know, I, you know, Jimmy and I, after Gatlin was born, so we were at a crossroads, you know, I was, I was, I was 41 and we were busy and, but you know, I yet in my heart, I felt like I was supposed to have a girl and. You know, and I had some friends that have gifts that were dreaming. I had dreamed many dreams about me with another daughter. And I was like, um, okay, Jimmy, what are we going to do? We got, you know, obviously, if you look at me, I'm going to get pregnant now. So uh, <laughs> we, we got to be careful or do something. And so we, we decided to wait a year and really pray and be like, God, you know, we don't, we're not asking for another child. We're asking for a daughter. If, if you're going to give us a daughter, then it's in your hands. We're not going to, we're not going to tie your hands by having surgery. We're going to wait and and give it a year. And then we'll see, you know, at that point, we'll just know that it wasn't your will or your plan. (laughs) And, uh, I was getting sick off of birth control that I'd taken for 20 years. So I ended up switching and it was during that switching that, um, you know, when you have a baby, there's not a lot of time for infant intimacy. So it it was totally, (laughs) we weren't trying to get pregnant. That's wild. And I got pregnant and I knew it was my girl. You know, it was a girl. Jimmy was so scared when we got that gender reveal note <laughs> yeah. that it was going to be a boy. He's like, I knew you were going to jump off a cliff or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I said, uh, you know what? I just, at that point, I would just like, whatever you want, God. He gives us what we want, but not really when we want it. Not necessarily how we want it. Ooh, I'm, I'm starting to be like, don't pray for peace. God doesn't give you peace. Peace. It gives you a situation where you can practice learning peace. And oh man, it's like, why can't you just? I pray for something and give it to me like a Christmas gift. And it just, I don't think it works like that. That's that's when the in the you know the recovery things that we do. You pray for God's will and the power to carry that out. And that's really it. No request for myself. Dangerous for an addict, you know. And you once in keeping with that, I'm like, well, I just need to have a better attitude because what's going to happen is going to happen, and I can be in absolute heaven in a bad situation or I can be an absolute hell in a good situation and that's it's really I would say it's it's in my head but it's not it's in my heart and when my heart's right I'm good in the worst situation my heart's not right I'm bad in the best situation and and uh I'm a slow learner (laughs) I'm a slow learner well I want to go on record in case my my son Gatlin ever does watch this interview and saying that looking back now I I would never change it. I would never make him a girl. I would, I, he is such a special boy and he has a great gift from God. And, you know, he's, he's very sensitive. He's very tender hearted. And I do believe God has a great plan for his life. And if it had been up to me, he wouldn't have been here in the first place. So, you know, looking back now, it's like, I, I'm blessed because God did answer my prayers and give me the daughter that I prayed for. But, you know, I, I, he knew Gatlin needed to be here. And it's so many, like so many people that adopt children because they can't have children. And then as soon as they adopt a child, they get pregnant. Like it's Lee Miller. I don't know if you know Lee, Lee and yes. Jamie Miller. Yeah. They adopted three children and then had another one. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, so I trust God, you know, that I've learned to trust him a lot more. And Gatlin knows because it was a running joke. We told, I told my boys, your mom cried when she found out you were a boy. <laughs> All of them to go with that. And <laughs> Yeah, they they know and they thought it was funny and they're yeah she's That's awesome. she's she proved to them many many times that so maybe it's not too late for a girl oh well, it's too late <laughs> oh oh, oh it's, it's way too late yeah a granddaughter would be closer to my cousin's daughter Dolly is our like pseudo granddaughter yeah oh gosh that the little Dolly is the reason I keep working because I'm like if we have grandkids and there's any anywhere close to this amount of time and money spent on this kid I have to keep working Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I always have um I didn't want to do it like the very last thing but so we're kind of in this and I'm not I always think I'm gonna know someone's answer but I don't really necessarily know it but I, I like to ask what is the uh What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? And what's the best thing that came out of that? Well, I mean, there's some pretty darn close things, you know, that I think of. But I think losing losing Ava was was probably the hardest, worst thing that ever happened to me. But there's another whole side of the story that we don't really have time to talk about. But I started notice, noticing the birds when she died. 
And I started getting visitation from birds. That was way supernatural. Is that you too? Yes. Um, but just way beyond coincidence because it was happening more than, than I'd ever noticed before. And I knew that God was sending um, comforting birds to to me to show me that he loved me. And so that, th- he opened my eyes to a world of, of, uh, of supernatural comforting things that he brings to us that I would never have seen. I, I mean, I don't know if we're just crazy people or whatever, that you're in the club as well. I mean, birds, we have bird stories that you wouldn't, that are not even believe. And I literally, there's a picture in my workout room in the garage with, with that Sage on it. And, there's, and I look at it and I see it every morning. I spend a minute with him, whatever we're doing. And, and uh, it was, I've had a little bit of a difficult morning. It's about a month ago. And there's like a, like a knock on the window. Knocking on the window, and I look up, and it's a cardinal. Just we have car- the cardinals, you know, the thing about them. Yeah. And he's like knocking on the window, <laughs> you know, looking at me. <laughs> we, have, we have a thousand bird stories, but yeah, I honestly, I thought birds were something that crapped on your car. I was not, well, I would, or you hunted, with, you know, an eight. Uh, just not, not into birds, and I just, I love birds now. It's yeah. my thing. Like there's, there's this, uh, we have this little place in Florida. We go, and there's this little little group that we walk on the beach and there's this yellow condominium and all the birds hang out in front of that place every time for like a year and a half. Every time I walk by, there's this huge group of birds. So I like literally like go visit this group of birds. It's, I'm insane. I have a cardinal tattooed on my arm. And We're going to yeah, have to have another conversation about just the birds because it's powerful. I mean, I, I had a bird experience. So the first time I had a bird experience um, was at a time right before I met my husband. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was 34. I was um, had been in some, you know, bad relationships and trying to make something work that wasn't meant to be. And, and I was very lonely. And I was like, I went to bed, cried my eyes out one night. And, and I woke up the next morning. I'm like, God, you know, please give me some peace about, like, where I am in my life and that I'm going to meet someone and that, you know, that I'm not going to grow with an old, lonely person and, you know, bring peace to me. And, and, and so I'm sitting there on the couch perfectly quiet like there was no heat running no no street noise no nothing it was completely silent and i'm sitting there and i'm like okay i'm praying like lord please help me and i and i hear this bird singing like in the window right maybe a couple feet away from me and this i can't do it i can't whistle it was one two three four five a beautiful song it was just singing like while i'm praying like give me a word give me a word and so i acknowledge this and i'm like praying so I say amen, and I let my Bible fall open, and it falls open to Matthew where it says how he feeds the birds <laughs> and how not to be anxious for anything and that he cares for us and that, you know, he's working things for good. And I just started weeping. I'm like, Lord, you sent that bird to sing to me because you knew I needed some kind of hope. It brought me hope that God hears my prayers and that I'm not just wandering around down here and, you know, without any destiny or purpose. And... And then I had another thing happen to me with the bird. And then, so I told you Ava means little bird, our baby girl that we lost. And which just ties it all together. And so the when she, when I gave, I delivered her, it was like three in the morning. They sent me home from the hospital the next day. It was like nine in the evening and I was exhausted. And um, I got up at like four the next morning. And it had been storming nasty outside. It had been raining and like awful. When I woke up that morning, it was pouring. And it was like four in the morning and I woke up and I can't tell you that feeling when you're sitting there and for six months you've you've had a baby in your stomach and you've been planning and preparing the nursery and and you wake up and there's no baby in your belly, there's no baby in your arms, there's nothing. It's all gone. It's all gone. And I'm just sitting there like trying to heal and like, so brokenhearted, so grieved. And uh, so I'm like, what do I do? You know, what do I do? So I'm like, I, I'm, it's good to express your feelings. And so I start, I get my computer out and I start typing like just a love letter to Ava. I'm like, mm-hmm. it just helps me to get it out. So I'm like, you know, Ava, I wonder what you would have been. What would you have looked like? Would you have been a dancer? Would you have been a singer? Would, you know, how would you have gotten along with your big brother? And all the things that I'll always wonder about her that I'll never know, you know? And, um, and I get down to the end and I say, Ava, your name means little bird. <laughs> and, I, and I hope that you'll come and visit us and that you'll watch over your brother. And 
and I finished the letter and I'm like, I love you so much, mommy. And, and I finished the letter and I'm like, I'm going back and I'm rereading everything I've written. And I got down to the part where it says, Ava, your name is little bird. And in the midst of this pouring rain, this bird starts singing to me like a few feet away, right outside my window. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh yeah. What? Oh yeah. So I feel you. it, it brought the peace of God to me. Like I just said, Oh God. Yeah. You're here. You're here with me. Like you, this is in your hands. This mm -hmm. is, I'm in your care. This is not surprised you. Yeah. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. She's with you. And then I was like, okay, wait a minute. A bird's out here singing to me. And how do I scripturally back this up? Like, how do I understand? And you can't, because if you want to just say there just happened to be a bird, then you're going to say that. And that's cool. But Go listen, ahead and, but like, listen. But, but then I started thinking like, okay, what happened when Noah, when the ark landed? A bird was yeah, the comforter, yeah. a bird. What happened when John baptized Jesus? The Holy Spirit ascended yeah, as a, a dove. A yeah. dove. Yeah. And so God has used birds all through the Bible to bring comfort to people. And yeah. so that was like, oh, okay, there's my comforter. So I love birds. And we made a whole Amazing. record about it too. Really? About that oh, please. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I couldn't be more with you and it feels so odd. And I, there's some of my friends that think I'm literally lost my mind and I don't care, um, <laughs> so but like birds are a total thing with us. And then other of my friends that like send me pictures of a cardinal um, every time they see one. There's a thing when when my wife's grandfather grandmother died, um, she would always oh my my cardinal came today. This, this just gives me comfort. My grandmother, I'm like this is some Catholic thing, whatever. I don't know, but I apparently the cardinal is a sign of lost people. That we've had so many cardinals. Okay, so when the year that that Sage passed away, our backyard was like a cardinal farm. I'm not kidding. There would be 12 cardinals. I don't even see 12 cardinals together. No. Unless they're a baseball team. Uh, <laughs> it, it, that was a little baseball joke for you. Um, it, it, there were so many. It was like, this is freakishly odd. And then she started feeding them and even more. I mean, they're like the the bird lady. We became these really weird people that, that fed the birds and waited for them to come. But... Um, it's unbelievably healing, and I love birds, and I'm I'm totally with you. I don't know, yeah, I, I was that. not a bird guy before. Wow. Definitely was not not a thing. Um, I'm so like you're a really peaceful person, and and uh, thank you for for sh sharing that. But not just like in a thank you for sharing that. Like I I, I feel like I know you uh, because of the loss, and because of the willingness to go there, and because of the common solution that's there, and um, yeah, it's just really, yeah, it's a lot of peace. I'm, I'm really grateful that you agreed to do this because if I were you, I would scare me. <laughs> and it would be, but, um, and I love, by the way, it, when I say that your husband's talented, like I, there's a lot of great talent in this town, whatever. He's the freak. Like he's a freak Aww. singer, writer, player, just Thanks. absolutely ridiculous. So whatever your kids are musically, it's gotta be <laughs> insanity. I'm just already... I can't really fathom it, but they are they it. singing already? Yeah. So our oldest is 11 and a half and, um, he's, he can't, he won't put the guitar down. He's playing guitar, taking piano lessons. He can sing like he does all the Bruno Mars licks and all the, you know, he's, he can do the pop licks and the, but he <laughs> loves music and he's 11 and, uh, and they can sing harmony already. Now Gatlin, he's seven now. And, uh, he's my harmony singer. Like he'll, he'll get up on stage with us all, every night. I can ask him to sing anywhere and he'll do it instantly. Like he's not shy. Aiden's shy. Gatlin, he'll sing for anybody, anytime. And he'll sing for tips too. And, um, <laughs> yeah, he's made that clear, but if you ever need some therapy on being the harmony singer, uh, I'll talk to him because I, I am the, I'm the harmony singer. But he's great. And, uh, you know, he plays the ukulele. He won his talent competition at school, the whole elementary Oh, that's not even school. fair. The uh, only way it's fair is if John, John Randall and Jesse Alexander's kids go against Joe's kids. Cause they're the two most talented couples that I know. That's, I that'd love be tough. them. And, and Ava or Evia, sorry. Um, I'm sure Ava's a singer, but Evia, uh, our yeah, that's baby one thing girl, you do know. She's a singer. <laughs> yes, yeah. for sure. Evia, uh, she's five and a half and she has perfect pitch. So she can, she can listen to like learn any song, Disney song or whatever. And she will always sing it in the exact key that it was recorded in every single time she's got it. And I, Jimmy and I don't have that either. I was going to say, do you have, because my, my oldest sister has perfect pitch. And I it's, have um, relative pitch, but not perfect. So I'm glad she's got it. I've got relatively imperfect pitch, but I, I mean, I, but I, yeah, if you tell me what key it's in, I can kind of, I'm pretty, pretty okay with it. But our That's oldest awesome. sister, she's like, uh, 
she has perfect pitch. She could tell you what a car horn is. She'd be like, well, it's a little sharper than a B flat, but it's, yeah, it's basically. And so the other day she said, um, she said, yeah, I'm lo I said something about her having perfect pitch. She said, I'm losing it. She's a music teacher at a school. I'm, I'm kind of losing it. I'm like, really? So you just can't do it at all anymore? She goes, no, I, I can be like a half step off. I'm like, that's not losing it. That's people tuning down. And <laughs> It's 432. Yeah, yeah, whatever that is. Yeah, it's Which, I, that's a, we made a record in 432. It has to do with birds and the nature and the sounds and all that really? stuff. Yes, it's amazing. Calming? Is it slowed down a little bit? No, is the, that, it's the pitch. It's the pitch. A, is it lower? It's eight hertz lower, so you wouldn't really recognize it. Have you ever noticed, like, in church or anywhere, people start singing, the piano comes in, and everybody sounds like they're a little flat, and then everybody goes up. It almost happens every single time when people sing without a reference, is that right. our natural voice, the Gregorian chants, people naturally sing in 432, and that's because nature is tuned to the to 432. And I heard that Hitler did the speed up. Hitler and, you know, yeah. yes, the Rockefellers, they yeah. did all kinds of sound. To A440 is, 440. is what we That's all right. tuned to. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we really got to studying about that. Again, it was right around the time I lost Ava and we'd written these songs and like it was that record is so special. It, the record is subtitled A Journey from Pain to Praise, but the mm. album's called Nature Symphony in 432 and First time the Isaacs ever had a symphony on a record, but it was super cool awesome. and it was a healing record. My, okay, so in 2014, what a year. Two weeks before I lost my little girl, my mom's mom, my grandmother, my Jewish Holocaust surviving grandmother died. Mm -hmm. Another bird story to go with that. Um, my sister was battling, my sister's battled Crohn's disease for 15 years now and um, anxiety, stage fright, all kinds of things. My sister that sings with us. So wow. the year was just, everything was just happening <clears throat> right then. And so, but man, I'll tell you, all the songs that we were writing out of that, and that album is one of my favorites and God just used it. But the whole 432 thing is very healing and it sounds like weird and- I want to listen to that record. Yeah. One, thank you so much for being willing and doing this. And number two, I have, I have one last question I want to ask and I don't know exactly how to ask it, but, and it's not, there's no, point to it. I just, I'm just curious. Do you observe Ava's birthday? Is it still a day that you, I mean, I, I you know, not even publicly with someone, but I, it's bound to be still a day, right? It is. And, um, it's really sweet because my kids, um, they've heard me talk about her so much mm -hmm. on stage and you know, that they recognize her and they never met her. My, mm -hmm. my oldest one was three when she passed. So he wasn't there at the hospital. He never held her or anything like that, but, but he's, <clears throat> he saw some pictures and so he feels, but what's so amazing, I have to tell you this, this is real quick. So I asked God to give me a dream about her because mm -hmm. when, when she was small, when I, when, you know, when I lost her and, and I just wanted to know what she looked like. And so I, I just kept asking God, like, will you just please let me know what she looks like? I just want to know, like, what does she look like? And, and so, um, I never, so I prayed that specifically one day and I was really hurting for her. And, and that night I didn't dream about her, but my son and he was about six at the time, six or seven, Aiden. He came to me the next morning. He said, Mom, I had the best dream last night. And I said, you did? And he said, yeah. He said, he said, a little girl ran up to me at the playground. And he said, she said, I'm your sister. Will you play with me? And I said, Aiden, you saw Ava? And he said, yeah. And I said, what's she look like? He said, she looks just like me, but she has long hair. And I was like, Oh my gosh! That's you almost about better than you getting sister. the dream, isn't it? Yes, it's so crazy, and so God let him see it, and I think that was supposed to happen. And I don't know why I wasn't allowed to see her. I was pregnant again, so maybe it had something to do with that. But that was enough for me. Like I know she looks like my Aiden, and he's very distinct oh, yeah. looking, blonde hair, blue eyes, really, really cute. And then my other two look alike. They look more like each other. There, a lady came up to me at a concert one time and she had she had an experience, another long story, but she had a, a brain stem stroke and she was brain dead for 10 minutes and she said she visited heaven. And the things that she saw in heaven were like very, very real to her. And she said that she met some children up there and she said she she met Dad like two minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. Even as much time as you want. Yeah, please. So so people, you know, people can come up to you and say things all the time and you you have to discern like if it's real or if it, you know, but she had this really cool, like British accent. Oh, I love your music. And I'm like, Oh, thank you so much. Where are you from? She's like, I'm from Georgia. And I'm like, no, you're not. She's like, yes, I am. I had a brainstem stroke and I have what's called stroke accent syndrome. When you wake up from the stroke, you talk different. And so it affects the, your speech when you have a stroke like that. But she was brain dead for 10 minutes. And she said, I visited heaven. And she was so, 
so excited about talking about it. And she said, I saw a little girl in heaven and she was about yay high, she said. And she said, she looked just like you. And she said, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know who she was, but she kept looking at me. And she said, now I know it was your daughter. And she said, she was so beautiful. And she was like, she had long blonde hair. She looked just like you. She said, she looked just like you with long blonde hair. And my sister was there and she went and got a picture of my son. And she goes, this is Sonia's children. She said, this one. She looks just like wow. him. And she pointed out my Aiden. Just like him, but long blonde hair. Oh, that was your daughter. I met her in heaven. And she met other children. She said that she had, um, there was a young man there. And, um, and she said he looked like he was maybe in his 20s. And he came over to her. He said, look, I'm not burned anymore. And he's showing her his hands and feet. And she said, what do you mean? He said, I'm not burned anymore. And she said, do I know you? And he said, my name is Blaine Johnson or whatever his name was. And... And he said, I'm not burned anymore. He was so excited and she didn't recognize, she didn't know him. And so after her stroke, she woke up, she couldn't talk for a long time, very affected by the stroke, but she would draw pictures and tell stories to her family. And she said, she told her spiritual, her mother, spiritual mother, she called her a friend and she, about what she'd saw in heaven. And she said, you need to go. She, she said, there was a young man who was killed about two weeks ago. He had a car wreck and his truck caught on fire and he burned up in the truck. And this was his name, and she knew the name of the kid. And, and she's like, you have to call his mother and tell her, tell her that you saw him in heaven. And she's like, oh, no, she'd think I was crazy. And so, so that her spiritual mother <laughs> said, if it's meant to be, then you will connect and you'll be able to tell her. Three days later, she gets a knock on her door, a, a flower delivery. And mind you, she's still recovering from the stroke, so people are still sending flowers. And the lady brings the flowers in, and she said, I don't normally do deliveries, but I'm working today. I own the flower shop. And she said, what happened? She said, I had a stroke. And she said, I just lost my son a few weeks ago. <laughs> and she said, you did? And she said, yeah, he was killed in a truck accident. And she said, his name? And she said, Blaine? Blaine's your son? And she said, yeah. And she said, I have to tell you something. And she tells this mother the story. And the mother falls on her knees and starts praising God and, like, crying. And, like, God connected them. Okay, and she said, I knew when I saw you sing, hmm. I knew I had to tell you that I saw your daughter in heaven. And so it was just like, okay, heaven's real. That is, Our yeah. children are there, and yeah. they're safe, and it's an amazing yeah. place. And so we're going to see them again. I have a friend. You probably know Jimmy Lee Slows. Yes. Player. He, he had a heaven experience when he was a small child. I don't even tell everyone. And he lost a child. He's part of my group. And um, it's amazing. So I started, I read a book called To Heaven and Back, Oh, and then Seven Lessons from Heaven with uh, from Mary C. Neal, and this woman that had a heaven experience completely, and highly recommend it. Uh, and then I just started reading and YouTubing near-death experiences, and it's so, there's so many common threads, and I get so much comfort and solace from it because I'm like, if, of course it's there, but I'm, you know, I, I, I want all of the reassurance that I can get. Yeah. And um, it's, that's, that's amazing. There's so, there's stories like that, but that one, and she had other stories too. Her sister and she were very close. And her sister married um, a black man. She was white. She wasn't married a black man. And and my friend Tabby that died and went to heaven. She said that she saw a little girl that ran up to her, and she was a biracial, beautiful little girl. And she said, I didn't know that I knew who she was. And she was just kind of hanging on my skirt and everything. And and uh, she said when she came to from her stroke that her sister called her. And she said she said this little girl looked just like her sister. And she said, her sister said, um, she told her sister, said, there was a little girl in heaven and she looked just like you, a little biracial little girl. And her sister hung up on her. And her, she called her back the next day and she said, I never told you this, but I lost a baby when I was about four months in and I never told you that. And I guess they were not married yet. So, mm. isn't that crazy? I'm like, oh crazy. my gosh. Wow, I love it. I need to meet this person, but know, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> You're amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for what you're doing, and it helps so many. Thank you. And you never know who, we don't know what tomorrow brings. And there's going to be more people go through this kind of grief, and they don't know it yet. And so even people that you're helping prepare for things that they don't even know, God bless you. Keep telling me.